First, I'll start with thanking uh, the Liebers, the board, those who um, nominated me, those who determined that I was fit to win this award. I'm truly um, honored to do so. Um, Bob is going to be a hard act to follow. Uh, scientists are not at all known for being uh, funny or entertaining. And my teenage daughter will be only too happy to tell you that I have zero sense of humor. Um, uh, but, but I'm going to do my best. I'll take us back to talking about science. Before I do that, I do want to say, uh, I will have slides now that I have a clicker, um, that I'm going to talk a lot about genetics. But genetics is not destiny at all. I don't think that. Most of the people who are doing psychiatric genetics and genomics research don't think that. However, it is something that we know is very important. And if we could really have a full understanding of it, it should move us much further along into understanding all how, how all of those other epigenetic or environmental or situational, whatever you want to call them, factors are sort of interacting with who we are at this genetic level to produce our personalities, our traits, those things that are wonderful about us, and some of the things that are more difficult for us. So the main points that I'll make is that I think that genetics and genomics are, in fact, leading to greater biological understanding. and. We are doing this by making presuppositions that we're going to use it to, to identify a variety of pathways that will, in a way that's more, more cogently holds together and let us move to different and new ways of treating the disorders. Genetics is already helping us reframe our nosology, and that will continue, and you heard some of, of that from, uh, some, some about that this morning. Um, and more and more, there are genetic insights that can play a role in uh, treating patients. They haven't really made it into the clinic, um, and it's something that I'm personally dedicated to uh, for the future. So um, I often like to start with this um, because it's a, a, a beautiful demonstration of just how much our genomes influence, uh, can influence the development of brain circuitry. So a couple of years ago, um, uh, there was a lab that used, put, put a few um, embryonic stem cells in a dish. They added a couple of, of growth factors, and they spun for a while. What was, they, they spun the mixture. And what they found was something that looked eerily like a little mini brain. This has started an enormous field um, of using these to study uh, genes and other factors that are involved in uh, psychiatric and, other, uh, and a whole variety of other disorders. Um, but what we know from all of the years of studying genetics and genomics is that when this beautiful choreography goes awry, it does not go awry because a single gene is not working properly. So one of the mysteries, and I'm going to, I have for my entire career been studying uh, schizophrenia and bipolar disorder simultaneously because I worked initially in an emergency room um, at Mass General and I knew I couldn't really tell the patients apart frequently and that there was something about both disorders that we were going to need to study simultaneously. I'll focus a lot of the talk and some of the initial parts on schizophrenia. Um, but the mystery has always been, and this applies equally well to bipolar disorder, that they're inherited, but they're common. So for years, the inherited part um, was appreciated, the common part uh, and, and its role was less well appreciated. The inherited part, they seem to fall, it seems to fall strongly in families, led people to use linkage analysis. And you heard uh, in, in Francis's talk that this, you know, there were lots of publications, they were very high profile, they were all wrong. Um, and, you know, thousands of patients were collected over the years, and we really now know absolutely conclusively that after thousands of families, there are no single strong genes that account for why a lot of people develop either schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. That doesn't mean that there's not genetic underpinnings. It's just the architecture, what comes together 
um, may be different than it is for other kinds of diseases. So if I were going to summarize the last 10, or 15, 10 years or so of uh, data that was derived in the field, I would say that it all adds up to the fact that there is strong evidence of polygenes, that there are many hundreds or maybe thousands of DNA changes um, that are involved in risk. This was first demonstrated by our group. Um, in schizophrenia and bipolar disorder now in, I think, about 2009 by the International Schizophrenia Consortium, which I um, was leading, by a very simple uh, uh, set of conceptual experiments where we said, um, maybe all of these little effects are too small to see individually, but if we put them all in a bucket, and we asked if that same bucket was found in another sample, we'd say, oh, and it was, we'd say, oh, something in that bucket is relevant. And so we were able to do that. We were able to show, surprisingly, that um, there were thousands of these and that they accounted for a substantial portion of the genetic liability to, so the part of the diseases that we think are genetic, the amount of that that um, is causing disease. That, surprisingly, a very large number of these alleles overlapped with bipolar disorder, um, but not any other psychiatric disease. So this is very important because it tells us something that maybe shouldn't have been surprising. <clears throat> it tells us that there are many, many more contributors to the disorder. And our neurobiological and other methods for studying things one gene at a time may be completely inappropriate for this disease. So the BBC got it. The New York Times thought that this concept um, was anathema. They said, it, uh, it, Nicholas Wade in his blog said, it seems to me the report represents more of a historic defeat, a Pearl Harbor of schizophrenia research. But what I would argue is that if this is the architecture, we better deal with it. And if there are many, uh, uh, many aspects of our DNA that are involved, it may mean that really there is less destiny to any one particular change, more hope potentially more places for intervening, more <clears throat> potentially more options. So now, tech how did we come to all of this? Well, there were a series of technological advances, microarrays, DNA sequencing, that have allowed us to find these sort of replicable factors. Just to remind you that really what we know, which we didn't know um, early on in doing this, is we all differ at our DNA a lot. We have small places where everybody differs, one individual base pair. There are large parts of our DNA that each of us carry around that really don't seem to cause any problems. Everybody inherits some really bad um, changes, but most of them don't seem to cause uh, problems. And many of these DNA variants will cause subtle or large changes in how our genes are working. And so figuring out which ones are real and which ones are not is, has been the challenge over the last 10 years. So in 2007 and 2008, our group published the first new technology successes, which were in bipolar disorder. And we knew right away from these first uh, two publications and the, and the publication that put it all together that very large samples were going to be involved. And we were able to begin this process of identifying um, specific genes, in this case, uh, uh, an ion channel, um, as well as a neurodevelopmental molecule. Um, fast forward to 2014, the most recent publication for schizophrenia, there are now uh, over, well over 100 regions in the genome um, that are associated with risk. These regions, however, don't tell you exactly what gene it is, and that's what I'll talk about a little bit um, as we go on. A big effort right now is connecting the genetic risk and figuring out exactly what gene it, it influences and how. And this is some work I, of uh, Steve McCarroll and, and uh, uh, the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium identifying uh, a complement gene um, and, and as one in which no one would have thought was involved, as clearly involved in increasing risk, changing the gene expression of the particular gene, and in, in uh, biological experiments potentially involved in, synap in synaptic remodeling and synaptic pruning. Now, uh, much more needs to be done, but it, it's an example of how we can actually get at new biology. So um, I've told you about the common variation 
in the population. We also find a lot of risk in uh, variation that's rare. Um, however, what was hoped was that this rare variation would, um, uh, that there'd be a lot of it and it'd be stronger, and so it'd be easier to go directly from um, the gene to the biology. Turns out it's just as polygenic, or I don't know, I can't, that, that may be an overstatement. It's clearly very polygenic, um, and it hasn't been easy, and there's been no low-hanging fruit. So our first two studies are listed at the top. Most recently now, they're up to sequencing of 20,000 individuals, and all they got was a single gene. So it's hard. It's, really, it's an interesting gene, um, but substantially more um, uh, exome and, and whole genome sequencing will be needed to begin to find patterns about the rare variants. We also heard that psychiatric diseases have more fluid genetic boundaries. Um, lumping and splitting, we've been doing it for a long time, but you can use the data now to show, and these are just a couple examples from our uh, publications from our group, that rare variants cross many diseases, subphenotypes seem to cross disorders, the heritability, you can look at which things are co-inherited, co -inherited, and the, there's a substantial overlap there. Um, and the sample sizes are uh, now getting large enough that you can ask questions in a more refined way. So um, in, a, in some publication, that, uh, publication that's in press right now um, from a grad student in my group, we've been able to show that the uh, uh, risk alleles for bipolar 1 disorder do in fact overlap with bipolar 2 disorder, um, and that uh, if you look at uh, DNA risk factors for schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, um, they are more elevated in bipolar type 1 patients than in bipolar type 2 patients. Um, and in fact, if we look uh, in uh, the schizophrenia risk, we use the schizophrenia risk, it's more enriched in patients who have aspects of both disorder or schizoaffective disorder um, than in bipolar 2 disorder, for example. And so the sample sizes are becoming much larger and we'll be able to, I think, dissect a great deal of this on a molecular genetic level. Um, if I put this all together now into a risk model, this is grossly oversimplified. But really, the point I want to make is that we inherit all kinds of things, rare and common, and somehow together they change the probability of which uh, particular disorder you're likely to express. Of course, this is, is um, uh, uh, only part of the picture, and the environment and all sorts of life events may also equivalently, um, you know, have a, a um, have the possibility of moving you in one direction or the other direction um, on the liability scale. So um, the key to success, uh, you heard, huge samples are needed. This is um, a project that I'm, we're just about completing right now, along with Ben Neal and uh, some others at the Broden at MGH. It's the largest experiment in psychiatry that's ever been attempted. We've genotyped 150,000 individuals. And the data is all collected. We're, we're finishing the analyses, but there are many more, <clears throat> um, many more genetic risk factors that we've identified. And the idea was to really extend this um, from schizophrenia and bipolar disorder to autism to uh, ADHD, and, and that's largely been true. And so those publications should appear over the next year or two. So when you find a candidate, when, when you have these regions, you don't know how to study them. They're uh, randomly arrayed across the coding region. They often are in regulatory regions. It's often large. It's hard to know which one. Very difficult to figure out where to go. So about five years ago when I moved to New York, I began building a resource uh, called the Common Mind Consortium that would allow us to make kind of molecular maps from human postmortem tissue that will be critical. We know a lot about the rodent brain. Um, but it doesn't really map appropriately. There's not enough genetic diversity, and so we've spent quite a bit of time, this is a public-private uh, partnership that's been successful in raising funds and, and gathering a lot of information. We make all of the data uh, public as rapidly as possible, generally pre-publication. Um, the data is all released through Sage BioNetworks, and I'll tell you about some data from our first RNA sequencing. 
This now is a very large resource, the largest resource that exists of the genetic control of brain expression. It is um, a, a, a resource that allows people to go and look up what DNA changes or what DNA variation controls the expression of particular brain genes in a particular region. Um, that's critical information for all kinds of studies. Um, and, and, and what we found was that even in studies of blood DNA, uh, uh, RNA sequencing from blood that are 10 times larger, you, they are unable to identify um, the genes that are really expressed in uh, this particular region of the brain. So I'd encourage people to use that. Um, but really, we're not just collecting all this information. We want to know how we can interpret the genetics. So it's about connecting the genetic control of gene expression with the underlying risk. And so there, there is a huge active area. This is our particular um, uh, way we've gone about it. We connect our our gene expression data with the largest PGC, the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium Schizophrenia Study. We have used a statistical method called Sherlock, um, and then we move to being able to validate what we find uh, statistically. <clears throat> so using this, we found a number of the, the loci where there's only a single gene within them um, that can account for uh, both the gene expression that shows gene expression differences and uh, genetic differences. And they're really very fascinating genes, um, uh, uh, an enzyme, some, some postsynaptic and some presynaptic molecules, so quite logical. Um, and the, but the important question then is, okay, so are these functional, are these relevant? You've got some things where you know there's risk factors for changes in gene expression. So we're starting, this is a long process, but we've used a zebrafish model to ask the question about if we change the levels of those genes, not, not to produce disease, but to just say, do these genes, when they're altered, affect a, 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 a sort of possibly uh, brain-related phenotype? Because there are going to be many of these, and we're going to need to find a simple way to screen. And what we have found is, at least for two of them, um, the, the furin and for T-snare, that it, the under or over expression, as is appropriately predicted, um, leads to changes in head size. We took it one of them further, um, which is the enzyme furin. And what, what we next asked was in um, cells from humans I, uh, that have been um, uh, uh, that are the progenitor cells for brain cells, if we change the level of furin, if we turn it down, does, it ha does something happen to the little processes, the neurites that migrate out? And you can see that there's a dramatic, differ a, a dramatic loss of these uh, migrating uh, neurites. Um, again, something that we often see um, as, uh, and, and hypothesize could be relevant to the neurodevelopmental aspects of the disorder. We next wanted to ask a question about the differential gene expression and co-expression networks. So what are the pathways that might be involved? And we, oh, sorry, sorry, my apologies, uh, my, my um, apologies. So um, I didn't realize I mixed these all together. But the, the first was just, are um, are there a lot of gene expression uh, differences? And what we find is that gene expression is really subtly disrupted. It's highly polygenic. Again, there are many, many parts, many, many uh, changes that are, are leading to small changes in gene expression. This is very different from what's in the literature. Um, and the estimate is that about 44% of genes differ in their expression level between the cases and controls. Here, we're talking about schizophrenia. Um, and then we can now use all of this genetics and genomics to ask which networks are not performing very well. Um, and what we find when we combine all of this data is that there are some modules of uh, pathways and that uh, a particular module is, high, is um, enriched for gene expression changes, schizophrenia risk factors. Um, and it contains a variety of genes that are involved in synapse function um, and neurodevelopment, as we would predict. The question is going to be, um, really, we have a lot of pieces now of the puzzle. 
And what we want to do is we don't have the box top. We need to figure out what the box top is. We're starting to have networks. What we'd like to be able to do is you know, use this information. We'll know that there are some, we'll know the pathways that are abnormal. Sometimes there will be single uh, nodes in the pathway that might allow you, that might be connected to one or another uh, gene or protein. Um, and you might be able to design a drug, for example, that uh, was able to improve or mimic that pathway. S what we ideally like to find are those nodes that are really connected to a large part of uh, the, uh, many of the pathways that are involved that are the key nodes to begin the process of developing uh, drugs to. In the last couple of minutes, if I, ha if I, if I have um, a, a little bit of, of time, I just want to talk about the fact that the targets um, of the drugs that we use are actually quite polygenic, um, much more so than I think we um, have ever, ever thought about before, and that this will have implications for drug development in the future. Um, this is a study published uh, just recently um, by uh, a, Nar a NARSED young investigator who has now moved um, off to Vanderbilt. Um, and what we tried to do was just ask questions about all the possible targets of drugs and did our anti, did antipsychotic, uh, uh, did, and were all of the genetic findings that we had um, so far, the rare and the common, were they enriched in any group or drug class? And it turns out what they're enriched in is um, the drug classification for antipsychotic targets. That's not surprising, right? They're, you know, um, they're, uh, uh, however, what we found was that there are about 350 genes in this group, um, and so there really are probably many, many more reasons that the antipsychotics are uh, influencing behavior than the sort of traditional set of um, uh, targets that we've tried to refine things um, look and looking for in the uh, in the past. Past one of the implications of this, I think, is that our current way of thinking about making drugs, that we need a single target, that we want it to be as clean an interaction with that single target, may be wrong unless it's one that we know for sure is a major node and really influencing um, a, lot of, uh, a, lot of, a lot of circuitry. Now, the last slide is that if the, these genetic risk factors that I've told you about um, are enriched in the genes coding for antipsychotic targets, then you might predict that individuals who had damaging mutations, things that turned off <clears throat> these genes, might be drug resistant. And we have a set of samples where we have appropriate uh, uh, treatment response information. Part of this is a natural experiment because clozapine is only given to individuals who are treatment resistant, so we don't actually have to interview all these patients. Um, and we have uh, uh, exome sequencing all of that on all of them. And so you can see that the proportion of cases with one or m with more than one um, disrupting mutation, so something that would make the target of one of the targets of the drugs not work, um, have a much larger number. Um, uh, patients who are treatment resistant have a much larger number of these mutations. So the implication, this of course needs to be replicated over and over again before we would even dream of using it clinically. However, this has the potential to short circuit that several year process um, by which a, 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 someone who is psychotic has to fail um, medications over and over again before they're treated with uh, closed pain. Um, and so in conclusion, Common Mind, we're building a large resource that we want to make publicly available. Um, we are more and more getting functional clues um, as to how the schizophrenia risk variants are mediating risk. Um, and genomics, I'm firmly, I firmly believe that genomics will make inroads into biology and future clinical treatments. And, I, you know, I, I, I get to give these talks, but there's an, there are an enormous number of people that I'm very grateful to, both in my group, um, in all of the consortia that I'm involved with, and also, of course, all of the patients and their families um, who have 
uh, willingly donated their DNA and their cells for, to make cell lines so that we can really delve, delve deeply into this. That's it. So, excellent. Now, in the last couple of slides, you were kind of hinting at pharmacogenetic yes. devices. Well, uh, oh, that mm -hmm. may have been me. How far are we from actual, I mean, I guess that's now use, used in some cancer uh, treatment, yes. but we really don't have very much going on in psychiatry. Right. How far do you think we are from that? Um, so, I, I, so I think that there are, it's a great question, um, and there are a number of aspects to pharmacogenetics. There are aspects related to um, avoiding side effects. Um, and that there, uh, there's been a lot of, of um, hope that we get closer to those. That's been really quite difficult. Um, on the other hand, we haven't, we're just touching the surface of using some of these rare variants in this more uh, um, uh, identifi identifying who's more appropriate for a particular mm -hmm. treatment which I see as a, a sort of a different aspect of pharmacogenomics. And I think that we, we are away, away from that, but this study, and there are several others I could show you, I think, that suggest that there are real possibilities, even, even now, where we have diagnostic dilemmas, where we might be able to use um, some of this information. Never on an individual basis, right? The genetics, in general, don't predict that you're going to get the disease or that if you, you know, are on the side where you have these rare mutations that you are absolutely going to be treatment resistant. However, they, they increase your, your risk one way or the other and because most of what we do is not done because we have a blood test or a, a way of knowing for sure what the right pick is, um, if we had a little extra genetic information, we might move and be more successful in one direction or the other. It's those kinds of studies that need to be done. Great, thank you. Uh, other questions for, I guess, for Dr. Squire? Are we good? I'm sorry. Yeah, but can we get the lights? Uh, yeah, there we go. Thank you. Here we go. Yes. Absolutely. So at the moment, um, uh, there are, are two sort of two directions. One has to do with um, developing the methods and applying the methods to these data sets I told you about so that we know what those nodes are in a way that's compelling, okay? Um, and when I mean compelling, that means reproducible, both biologically and statistically. Um, then the second aspect of that, which moves simultaneously, is using cell models that are from individuals where we have the full, their full genetic background, um, but who also either do or do not have the disorder or in, into which we've engineered the particular changes we're hypothesizing are relevant to tweak a node, and then studying how that influences the behavior of the pathways. I know, it's so hard to see right <laughs> Okay. Wave your hand so that you can, uh, yeah, so I can see where you are. Yeah, absolutely. So the question was, are there, is there any role of the gut um, microbiome? I don't know yet, but there's no reason to think that there might not be, right? I mean, it's, um, it's there. People are looking. You can, there's, it, you know, there are, um, uh, there's some evidence in autism that, you know, in, in particular, that their gastrointestinal, uh, uh, that their uh, GI issues. Um, you could, I can make all kinds of hypotheses. The data doesn't exist yet. So. Yeah, my question had to do with the. Um, I'm here. Here in front. Ah. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I saw you had identical twins yes. in your studies, so. Uh, these mutations that you indicated and a number of genes involved, were they replicated in identical twins or was there, had nothing to do with the genetic component and had to do with 
developmental mutations or whatever happened subsequent to the genetic inheritance? Right. So um, none of the data except um, the data on heritability, sort of initial heritability that have been collected over the years came from identical twins or from any kind of twins. Um, there, you know, it's rare to have large-scale studies where you have twins that have psychiatric disease from which, from whom you have um, genetic information. So at the moment, I'm, all of the genetic data is genetic data, so data around, um, um, uh, that, that come from an individual's genome, but it doesn't, it, it doesn't have to be coming from an identical twin. I may, I, we can talk afterwards, I'm not sure I answered. Last yeah. question for over here. Yeah. Anything on the uh, use of stem cells in developing medication which can be used in these uh, Absolutely. Analysis? I mean, you know, uh, we, like uh, many other groups, are developing these models because they give you a chance to um, uh, have a reproducible set of cells on which you can screen all kinds of new molecules. Um, and so we've done some of that. I didn't present any of the data today. Um, and uh, we are now em embarking more and more on the on pathway derived uh, and, and particular, and, and the focus on particular genes and pathways that we've identified in the other studies. So I think um, it's going to be an extremely fruitful thing to do. Difficult, but, but potentially very fruitful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.